If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 4. You're never too broken to belong. I tell you that, that um, boy, it's pretty hot up here too, gentlemen, by the way. Um, we often in our life, in our minds, get this idea that we're too broken. It's too helpless, life is too hopeless, that the wall is too big. And we can't climb it, and there's no way God's going to climb it this morning. With God's help, I'm going to preach on, preach on this topic, this sermon title, Breaking Down Barriers. And I'll propose this statement to you, and then when I look at it this morning, or this week and next week, that Jesus loves to break down barriers. We construct them in our life, and Jesus breaks them down. We can construct big ones, and Jesus can break down the biggest barrier in your life. This morning, you heard from some men about some barriers that they had constructed because of life choices. Some strongholds that were huge, seemingly insurmountable, that someone from the outside would say, listen, there's no way that that wall is ever coming down. There's no way for that barrier to be broken down. Yet Jesus breaks it down. He wants to break them down. He loves to break down barriers. You may be here this morning and feel like the barriers are too high, too big. I want to encourage you this morning that they're not too big for Jesus. We look in John chapter 4. We're going to read uh, a large portion of the, of the, of the chapter here because there's a tremendous, a tremendous account here. It's the account of when Jesus met this woman at the well. If you look in John chapter 4, verse number 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, verse number 3, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Remember verse number 4. He must needs go through Samaria. No accident that the Bible said he must needs go through Samaria. Remember that. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Number five, or verse number 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey. Jesus was wearied with his journey. I read an interesting thought about this particular phrase in that, that Jesus got tired. Jesus was not a, did not live a life of luxury when he was on earth. He lived as the common and even the poor lived. In fact, one place says that he has no place to lay his head. And it's a well-known fact that Jesus walked almost everywhere he went. He occasionally took a boat across the sea and once came in on a donkey, but other than that, he walked about everywhere he went. So when he came to this place, his feet were tired. He was tired. Jesus was physically tired. Isn't it odd that sometimes we think that Jesus, though the Scripture tells us that he was tempted in all points, yet, yet, like as we are yet without sin, and that we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with our infirmities, even though we know that to be true, we somehow think that Jesus can't feel what we feel. That he has no concept to, to know how we know. The Bible teaches us otherwise, that Jesus felt what we felt, what we feel. Those struggles and those burdens and those particular walls, of, that weariness, Jesus felt that right here. And the scripture says that he was weary. So what did he do? He sat down. I can identify with that. I've been tired before. What did I do? I sat down. <laughs> I can't take another step. We have hiked in the past, my family and I, and we've hiked some longer distances and, and enjoyed that very much. And you get into five and six miles of a hike and you get tired. You get tired. Your legs are water here. We have Jesus, a picture of Jesus as a, as a human, his human side here. Though he was all God and all man, he was tired, weary with his journey. And thus on the well, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. It was about noon. Sun would have been up and very hot, would have been beating down on the, the area, the area there in, the, in that eastern region would have been very, very hot, very warm. Not like Michigan at all, except maybe one five-minute spread on July the 3rd. Sun would have been most likely out. There could have been some clouds, but it's a, quite, a, quite a sunny region. It's about noon, and noon is not known as the cool part of the day, is it now? Noon is not known as a part where you, you do lots of work. Noon is where you kind of hide from the sun. But Jesus was tired and he sat down on the, on the well, it being about the sixth hour, verse number six. Verse number seven, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, give me to drink. Now at first glance, this particular phrase looks pretty rude. 
I don't see a please in that phrase, do you? I, I look closely. I don't see it in the Greek or, or any other translation. It doesn't say, give me to drink. But Jesus was not being rude. It was, a, it was a request, a simple request. He was asking for a drink of water. As would have been appropriate after a hard journey in the middle of the day in the sun in the desert region to ask for a drink of water. Jesus wasn't, apparently, we'll find out, equipped to draw water from this deep, the Scripture tells us well. So he asked someone else for something. You know that Jesus will ask things of us as well? As his believers, his followers, he'll ask us uh, to, to do certain things for him. What a great blessing to be able to serve our Jesus. To serve him, what a blessing. If you had been there that day, would you have given Jesus a drink of water? Sorry, Jesus, I'm a little bit too busy with what I need to do. Uh, I, I'm, I can't be occupied with what you have because I'm late for my next appointment. You see, sometimes we get too occupied with our agenda and miss the Lord's agenda. He asked this lady for a drink. Now, verse number 8, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered, said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith it to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Verse number 12, she asked, Listen, are you a, a, a bigger individual, larger than life than Jacob, even our, our father of, of this place we worship in this well? The answer is, yes, Jesus is bigger than Jacob. He's bigger than Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's bigger than everyone else in the universe because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus is bigger than everyone and everything. We're going to see some barriers, and we've already seen some. We'll see some more barriers. It just reminds me that Jesus is bigger than all those barriers. Pastor Howell, the wall is too big. The struggle is too great. The hopelessness, the, the well of hopelessness, hopelessness is too deep. Jesus is bigger. Are you greater? Yes, yes I am. Jesus answered, verse 13, and said to her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up in everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. Whoops. Whoops. Go call thy husband. I don't have one. You're right, lady. You don't have a husband because you've had five of them. And the guy you're living with now, the guy you're, you're, you're in a relationship with now, the guy that you're living with now who's supporting you and, and you're, you're creating immor immorality with, that's not your husband. This conversation just took a turn for the worst. This, this conversation just took a serious detour. Somehow we got from water to her immorality. Somehow we got from a little drink in the middle of the day to the problem of her life. Right now, somehow we made a gigantic left turn. And Jesus brought the conversation to a point. He brought it to a, to a point of recognition that she needed to see something here. She needed to recognize what was going on here. And it completely shocked her, this stranger. This stranger who just sat down the well. She'd never met this man before. I believe she probably has heard of the Messiah, though she did not recognize Jesus, because Jesus and his fame and healing people was across the whole region. No doubt she would have had some experience of knowing about this man who could heal people of Jesus, but did not realize that's, I think, who she was talking to at this point. And somehow this stranger just opened up her life like a book and laid it all out there. Maybe she looked around to see who was listening. Jesus said, that's right. In that statement... You weren't telling no lie. You said truly. You don't have a husband. 
The woman, verse number 19, saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. I love the Bible and its understatements. <laughs> sir, <laughs> sir, <laughs> I got no, I got no words. Because you just opened me right up like an open book. She said, our fathers, verse 20, worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship this father. Ye worship, ye know not what. Ye, we know what we worship for salvation of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in truth, for the father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right there, the Lord Jesus Christ brings a great theology, a great doctrine to us, and I'm so thankful for that. They had said the Samaritans had a different religion. They used even uh, claimed just the first five books of the Pentateuch. They rejected the Jews. Jews and the rest of the Torah and the law and the prophets, the Samaritans just believed, they said just the first five books, and they believed a different mountain than the Jews believed to worship on. So the Samaritan lady said, listen, we're supposed to worship here. And Jesus said, well, you worship over here, but let me tell you something, Jesus said, there's going to come the day really soon now when, when you can worship God wherever you are, and the Father seeketh such to worship him, and if to worship him, you must worship him in spirit as a spiritual being and in truth according to God's word. We are here this morning to worship God in spirit and in truth this morning. We're here because God has opened wide the kingdom of heaven for all those who believe to worship him. And the Father seeketh such to worship him. Verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Now, isn't that interesting? This lady knew of a prophecy of the Christ, the anointed one. When this Christ is come, she said, this will be a mark of this man. This will be something that this man will do. He will tell us all things. What did this man at the well just do? He told her all things. He, she said, listen, there's, I know the prophecy that when the Messiah cometh, he will, he will have this knowledge, this truth that is, seems to be a supernatural it seems to, to know things that he, that he shouldn't know, and yet this man she was just speaking, she's speaking to, just said, go call thy husband and begin to open her up like a book to show his fulfillment of that prophecy. And Jesus, just to make sure she didn't miss it, verse 26 said, I that speak unto thee am he. That verse right there is like a light switch. Click. That verse right there is like, whoa, mind-blowing. She's sitting there. She's talking to him. She's missing it. She's in awe and amazement from this apparently supernatural intuition that this man has. And all of a sudden, Jesus connects the dots and says, let me break it down for you. Let me explain it to you on your level. I'm him. Aren't you glad that Jesus makes it simple for us? He doesn't say, here, connect this dot and go through this puzzle. And, and, and maybe you've done those word searches or those things where you have those, those mazes to get through, right? And you, sometimes you get them, but if not, you double back on it three or four times. Use a pencil so you can erase the path so no one sees how bad you are at it. Aren't you glad that when Jesus comes to us and breaks down barriers, he doesn't make us go through all these mazes to him. He says, listen, let me, let me break it down for you. I'm him. I'm him. You have a problem? I'm the answer. You have a need? I'm the solution. You have a wall? I'm the wall crusher. I am he. She has the best response in a little bit. We'll see. And upon, and upon this came, verse 27, his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me, read those next two words, all things. You remember what she said in verse 25? The Messiah will tell me all things. Connected. Now she realizes this man was the promised Messiah. See, her life has changed. She now believes. She said, uh, uh, she told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Is not this the anointed one? Is not this the Savior of all men? This is him. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? And Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. A few years back, it's in Puerto Rico. 
Go on to a place called El Yunque. It's called it's a rainforest there. About maybe nine, ten years ago now. In El Yunque, there's a, a waterfall. The waterfall is, is quite a steep climb. I don't know how big or how high it is. It's, it's a good sized waterfall. Looking up this waterfall at this waterfall, and I said to my two brothers, I said, hey, let's climb to the top of this waterfall, up the side of this of this ravine or this 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 cliff, basically. And like good brothers and like idiots that we are, we said, hey, great, let's go. So we begin to climb this barrier. We climb and we find this vine and this tree and this branch and keep on going and almost fall over this part. Sorry, Mom. And uh, they're down there. And, and eventually, eventually, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes later, we get to the top of this waterfall. It's beautiful up there. We look over the edge and we can look down and see other people have dr- driven up the road to where the waterfall is at and, and they point at us and they're like, hey, they're, they're yelling, you kind of see them yelling, how'd you get up there? We climbed, we climbed. You see some other people begin to climb and, and then not make it and, and, and go back down and like, man, and so we're just having a good time. There's a little pool at the top of that waterfall. It wasn't too fast, so we swam a little bit in it and then, and then decided to come back down. Came back down, and some other people were asking us, well, how'd you get up there? We said, well, there's, a, there's not really a path. We just grabbed trees, and some other people tried to climb and couldn't get up there. And I'm so thankful that my Christian life is not like that waterfall. So that waterfall, when I looked down and other people said, hey, how'd you get up there? Hey, come on up here. They, they didn't make it. The Christian life is not that way. You see, Jesus wants to knock down the barriers in our hopelessness, we feel like no one cares, yet Jesus cares. In our helplessness, we feel like no one has a solution, yet Jesus has a solution. We sometimes imagine that we are over here and Jesus is over here, and there's no way to get from here to there, or no way for Jesus to get from here to here. Yet Jesus breaks down barriers. I want you to see today that Jesus breaks down a barrier of location. Verse number four. Bible says, and he must needs go through Samaria. I told you to remember that little phrase, he must needs go through Samaria. You see, Samaria was the direct, in a, in a direct route to where he needed to go. But the fact is that most Jews did not go through Samaria. They did not like the Samaritans. The Jews had a very, uh, a very tense racial divide between the two. The they, Jews felt the Samaritans were illegitimate. They had no dealings with the Samaritans. They would not speak to Samaritans, and especially not to a, a woman who was of Samaria. There was some huge tensions. And so when Jesus must needs go through Samaria, yes, it was a direct route. It was a little shorter. But most Jews would just go around Samaria, so they wouldn't even have to walk through that land. But Jesus said, or the Bible says that he must needs go through Samaria, not because it was shorter, but because there was someone that needed the gospel of Jesus Christ in Samaria. That's why he must needs go through Samaria. See, Jesus breaks down the barriers of locations. It was a location that was avoided. Jesus goes places that people avoid to reach people with the gospel. You know what Jesus touches? He touches people that are broken. He finds people whose lives are broken, whose homes are broken, whose relationships are broken, who who are physically or mentally broken, and Jesus goes there to reach those people. He must needs go through Samaria. Jesus saves people in church, and he saves them in jail. He saves them in church, and he saves them in jail. Aren't you glad he saves them both places? He must needs go through Samaria. People in our church in the past have spent some time in jail. That's all right. They're welcome at First Baptist Church. There's people who haven't spent time in jail, and they're welcome at First Baptist Church. Because Jesus must needs go through Samaria. He wants to break down the barrier of location. Jesus saves in the rich house and in the poor house. He saves in the nicest houses, and he saves at people who don't have any houses. He must needs go through Samaria. Why would Jesus want me? I don't have anything to offer him. He wants you because he loves you. He went to Samaria because there was love for the Samaritans and a love for a woman there who was coming to draw water from the well. It was a location that was avoided, but it was a location that was necessary. It wasn't just because it was convenient, it was because there were souls there. In the 1840s, John Getty left a church in Canada to take his wife and two small children to the South Sea Islands to begin a mission work there. After a voyage of more than 20,000 miles, they arrived in the islands. 
that were filled with cannibals. More than 20 crew members of a British ship had been killed and eaten just months before the Gettys arrived on the mission field. They faced the difficulty of learning a new language. They had no written form and the constant threat of being killed. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd be happy to go to the mission field, but I don't know if I'd be willing, as, as willing to go to a place where they eat people. It kind of puts a damper on your mission work if you're eaten, right? I mean, just, you know, and, and to take your family as well. Listen, I'm a dad. I got a wonderful wife and, and three wonderful children. To take my whole family to a place that, that, that one day you can't find your son because he's been eaten? No, Really? To think of that, we don't have that kind of pressure in, in Saginaw, Michigan. There's no threat of people eating us today. I'm hungry, Pastor Howell. Whoa, get away from me. <laughs> when, you, when you're working with cannibals, you go to their house, hey, what's for dinner? Don't ask. Don't ask. It's Joe. Oh, oh boy. A little chewy. Oh, boy. But he took his family to, to where cannibals were. Why? Because Jesus called him there. Because Jesus loves to break down barriers. And a barrier where other people wouldn't go, where other people wouldn't go, Jesus wanted his gospel to go there. He must needs go, and he went there, and a constant threat of being killed. Slowly at first, a few converts came. And then soon many more received the gospel. John Getty continued his ministry faithfully, including translating the entire Bible into the native language, and he planted 25 churches. 25 churches. In a location that a few months earlier, 20 British crew members had been eaten. A place that no one else wanted to go because they would eat people. A place that God called him to. And he planted 25 churches. For many of those years, he labored with little help and little word from home. But God was faithful to his servant. Still in the pulpit of the church where he pastored, there's a plaque in his honor which says this. Here's on the, on the plaque. When he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. And when he left in 1872, there were no heathen. When he came, there were no Christians. When he left, there were no heathen. You see, when Jesus comes, he can break down the barrier of location. He can come to where you're at. There's the old song that says, He came to me. He came to me. When I could not come to where he was, he came to me. The verse says, He came to me when I was bound in chains of sin. He came to me when I possessed no hope within. He picked me up and drew me gently to His side, where today in His sweet love I now abide. My question is, is Jesus coming to your location? In our mind, we feel He can be far away. In our unbelief, we think there's no way that Jesus would touch me. This woman, this woman who was known in the village as a woman of ill repute, that's why she was there at noon drawing water, they believe, because she would have been an outcast of the outcast. And Jesus went to see that woman. He sat down to wait for that woman. He took the time to speak to that woman. And that woman now will be in heaven forever. Jesus breaks down barriers. Is there a barrier in your life? Does it feel too large for Jesus to cross? He can cross it. Does it feel too big? doesn't matter where you are or who you are, the mistakes you've made. doesn't matter if you think or no one else understands. Jesus can break down the barriers. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I believe that there are some with barriers today in their life. Lord, I don't know all of the struggles. I don't know all the burdens, Lord, but you do. Lord, I believe that you want to meet those things and touch lives today. I wonder who would say, Pastor Howell, is, would you pray for me as you spoke? God spoke to me and there's a burden in my life, maybe a barrier, call it what you will, a struggle. And Pastor Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me and I needed that today. Maybe you feel discouraged, depressed, alone, helpless, hopeless. Who would say, Pastor Howell, when you, when you pray, would you pray for me that, that I would see God take down this barrier in my life? I have a need and I need that help. Amen. Amen. Who else? Pray for me. Amen. Hands all over. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. God spoke to me. I needed that. And, and Jesus, I want him to come and tear down the barrier. Who else? Would you pray for me? Who else? I didn't raise my hand before, but I'll raise it now. Would you pray for me when you pray with the others? Amen. I wonder if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. We want you to know, just like Jesus wants you to know, that He loves you. He loves you so much that He came to earth and He lived a perfect life to die on the cross for your sins. They buried Him and three days later He rose again from the dead. Now He lives. He wants to save you. Maybe you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I'd love to pray for you. He would say, Pastor Howell, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I'd like to be sure. When you pray for the others who ask for prayer, would you pray for me? Slip your hand up and slip it back down. I'll draw no more attention to you than I did anyone else. We'd love to pray for you. you. Say, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven. I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Just slip your hand up and slip it down. I'll, I'll see it and I'll acknowledge it. Amen. I see that? Amen. Lord, bless this time of invitation. Lord, may we see you tear down the barriers in our life that can be apt to discourage us, Lord. Would you show us how you reach us and touch us. Now you bring real everlasting joy and change. In Jesus' name, amen.